Good morning and welcome to today's webinar um, where we discuss the latest issues impacting and affecting banks and regulated firms alongside subject matter experts in the field. My name is Philip Allen, I'm the Director of Learning at the BBA and today for the next hour to discuss MIFID 2 in the new political and economic landscape I am joined by presenters Dario Cospini, CEO and Reporting Specialist at Kaizen Reporting, Ian Rennie, Senior Advisor at Kaizen Reporting, Matthew Vincent, Director in GM EMEA Regulatory Services at Credit Suisse, Rob Driver, Policy Director, Capital Markets and Infrastructure at the BBA. Before Rob kicks us off, may I remind you that this is an interactive webinar in which you can participate in two ways. Firstly, by asking questions throughout the presentation. Just click on the question tab below the screen and type out your question. We will endeavour to ask, answer as many questions as possible. However, if we don't have time to answer your question before the end of the webinar, we'll aim to do so by the end of today. Please note that it is completely anonymous so that we won't be sharing your name or your details with anybody else who's on the call as well. And number two, voting. Throughout this webinar, we want to gauge your opinions by asking you a few simple questions. To answer any of these questions, just follow the instructions on the screen. Well, over to you. Thank you, Philip. So I'm Rob Driver. I'm a policy director here at the BBA, and I lead <coughs> on MIFID. And um, one of the key areas for the BBA to focus on is transaction reporting. So this uh, webinar has come out effectively of the transaction reporting working group, which has been going for a number of years with a wide range of institutions joining, and I should make the point that all BBA bank members are welcome to attend. So if you are a banking member of the BBA and you're not part of the transaction report to work, if you'd like to be, please do let us know after this and join. Absolutely everybody is welcome. In terms of what we look at, we have two sort of general focuses. Firstly, we look at holistic and overarching issues. So for example, uh, the timing, the cutover from MIFID to MIFIR, and issues such as instrument data. And then we also look at more granular issues, such as uh, short selling natural persons and the actual data fields themselves. The BBA naturally responds to all consultation papers, so for example, uh, the ESM paper that was released at the end of December, we put a very detailed response to, which you can find on our website. And at the moment, the work we're doing is we're drafting a couple of letters for ESM. Firstly, we're looking at high-level concerns, and then we'll be going through the um, reporting fields in a lot more detail, and again, go back to ESMA with our thoughts and issues, and we regularly speak to the SCA and ESMA as you expect. So just to reiterate, it's a very active group, uh, anyone who's a banking member of the BBA is welcome to attend, and even if you just don't want to actually come to the meetings, you just want the papers and the thought process and the output, please do let us know and we'll, we'll certainly join you up. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, my name is Ian Rennie. Uh, I've been involved in uh, the implementation of regulation, regulatory obligations for the last 10 years at uh, a number of different organisations, including Kaizen, HSBC, and UBS. Um, today, I'll lead the conversation and look to bring in the other participants uh, to, 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 to events. And it really will be very much a conversation rather than a, than a lecture. So your involvement in that conversation would be welcome. As Philip said, do feel free to pose questions as we go through. We are broadly going to be looking at three uh, key areas which um, we think firms should be um, be, be involved in and thinking about. First item is what do we expect from the regulators? There are a number of items that are still outstanding that regulators need to work upon and we will explore those in the first section. Secondly, what are the key in industry issues? Not necessarily the implementation, implementation issues that yes will be hard and difficult but what are the issues that we still have as an industry? And then finally steps to get on the front foot and get ready for the go-live date in January 2018. So we're going to go on to the first, uh, first section, uh, which is what, to ex what, we, what we expect from the regulators next. And broadly speaking, I've put, collected this into six separate topics. Um, and the first one we're going to look at is what's what, what do we expect back from ESMA and the National Competence Authorities? Um, I think primarily we're looking for feedback on both the, the, the RTS 22, which incorporates the technical standards for reporting, and also the publication of the final guidelines. Just a note of administration, we're, sh we're just having a technical issue in bringing up the next slide, so if you, do, if you can just be patient with us, the slide will come up in a second. First of all, we look at the RTS 22. Now recently, and many of you may well have seen, 
that there have been some amendments that have been published to RTS 22. Um, some of the highlights of that include uh, the removal of waivers, uh, such as the LRGS waiver. I think there's been some clarification on, on um, pricing, the pricing fields, basis points, net amount and debt instruments. Um, but what I'd like to um, bring Rob Driver into uh, the conversation on now is if you can give us a sense of timelines when we, we think both the RTS and also the guidelines will be finalised and published. So Rob. Thanks Ian. So uh, RTS 22, as Ian said, is the key, uh, is the key um, standard for transaction reporting. So it's been adopted by the European Commission and is currently being scrutinised by the European Parliament and the European Council. We would expect that to be adopted uh, in late October or possibly November. Perhaps um, slightly more interesting might be when ESMA published their guidelines, so as I said at the top. ESMA produced a very detailed consultation paper on transaction reporting and also clock sync at the end of December, and the BBA responded to this in April. Essentially, this is almost like a how to do transaction reporting. It was well over 200 pages, very detailed, and an excellent ESMA, effort from ESMA, frankly, to, to put something so, with such guidance in it. We put together a, a detailed response on a number of issues, which we'll come on to later. Um, in terms of when that will come out, which is what I think most people are waiting for, we think it will probably be in the next six weeks, but it's quite easy to say and quite easy to think when something's going to be. So, for example, we did think it would be in September, but in reality, yeah, ESMA are very busy and frankly we'd want them to take their time over this and make sure it's as good as it could be before it's released. So, I would say probably in the next six weeks we can expect that. Great. Thanks, Rob. Matt, just from uh, your perspective, uh, obviously as chair of the BBA Working Group, um, could you give us, give us the two or three key uh, aspects that you're looking um, to, 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 to focus on when that, when, that, when that document finally is published? Well, I think when we, what we first saw, as Rob's already alluded, is that the, the document was significantly larger than we expected when it first came out. Um, they have obviously, <coughs> if we use the, the FCA's truck as the basis, which I think is about 60, 70 pages long, they've almost quadrupled that to 210 pages. So the detail is certainly there. Um, which we weren't expecting, and it's actually different to the TRUP in that it's scenario-based as opposed to really what the TRUP was principle-based, so they've gone into the nitty-gritty. I think, uh, it's a little while ago now, but what, I think one of the biggest, the biggest things that came out when we were going through that on the, you know, the page terms of the BBA was that the scenarios that they had didn't actually often meet the scenarios that we were familiar with. And I mean we, as in sell-side investment firms, and also, I'm fairly certain, five-size investment firms. So I think when we fed that back, and it will be interesting to see whether we get some more familiar scenarios that we, that we, that we deal with on a, on a daily basis. <coughs> that said, the scenarios did give us principles of reporting. I think may not have given us the exact scenario that we were looking for, and I can't think of a particular example, but they did give us a view as to what the regulator was thinking and what they're looking for. So even if we don't get the exact scenario that we need to plug into and obviously there's thousands of investment firms and there's 27 countries, so they're trying to put into one document scenarios that cover all of those different languages and um, methods of and means of behaviour. So I think primarily, more scenarios are asked for. Let's hope we've got some more scenarios. Great. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, we're going to turn now to um, a couple of the other um, outstanding issues that we've listed. And um, I'd like to look at two, two items, really. And again, they relate to our relationship and um, our interaction with the regulators. So first of all, I'd like to uh, discuss with Dario Crispini the, the impact of um, or, or the readiness that the industry will need to be in to participate in the regulators' um, industry testing. So the FDA, for example, have recently let the industry know that they will be ready for industry testing in July. So I'm going to invite Dario to explore that as a theme and maybe comment on the type of solution that they might be putting into place. And secondly, in his role, in his capacity as maybe ex-head of the Transaction Monitoring Unit, what tolerance, um, what the tolerance level in getting data quality 
uh, right or, or wrong um, that, that, that there will be. So, Dario, can I hand over to you? Thanks very much, Ian. Um, okay, so testing is in everybody's mind at the moment. Um, the arms are working, and the, the parties that are planning to become arms are working to provide uh, testing facilities and make those available. And indeed, some of the existing arms have already got their testing platforms available to allow testing under MIFID 2 to a certain degree. That only goes so far, of course, because those arms uh, need to pass those records down to the FCA if you're in the UK or the relevant competent authority if you're outside the UK. Um, FCA has taken the approach of changing the way it operates for transaction reporting and has appointed a, a third party provider to, to provide a reporting service. So the reporting service will um, be provided by a firm I think called Steria and they, will, they have been mandated to provide a testing platform available for industry-wide testing uh, from, the, from July 2017. Now that will give a good period for firms to engage in cross-industry testing. So that's te submitting records from their systems to their uh, appointed uh, arm and then on to the FCA and to test that full process. Um, one aspect of the FCA's service is that that will also apply to the collection of instrument static data from trading venues, which will be used to compile a list for reporting purposes, which will be used for validation of uh, records coming into the FCA and other competent authorities. So the FCA has gone to quite, to quite some length to make sufficient time available for testing. That's going to be significantly longer than we experienced under MIFID 1. Um, um, when I was at the FSA, we weren't ready for industry testing until towards the latter part of the few months before go live. So this is a, certainly a welcome, uh, a welcome improvement. And um, the, so the FCA is giving you time to test, but we've, we've had experiences with the MIR where the quality of the data, I think, at go live uh, wasn't to the standard that the regulators anticipated. Now for MIFID 2, we're not, it's not a new regime that's being implemented, it's the a continuation of an old regime with enhancements. So uh, regulators across Europe are using that data today um, on a daily basis and they will want to use that data post go live on MIFID 2 for continuation of their monitoring activities for monitoring uh, for market abuse purposes. That said, um, FCA will recognize the complexities, uh, particularly around the new instrument classes of uh, interest rate, FX, and commodity derivatives that are being brought into scope for reporting. So the, I think the, the level of tolerance that will exist around quality of reporting for the existing asset classes is going to be a lot lower than it will be for the new asset classes. So that's something for firms to bear in mind as from a kind of risk perspective and implementation perspective. It's also true that the, there is more uncertainty around the reporting and reportability of some of those OTC derivative instruments uh, in those latter asset classes. Thanks very much, Dario. That's, that's really, really uh, informative. Thank you. I think the final question uh, we uh, wanted to address or um, issue that we have there was uh, dealing with the with the regulators and also uh, and also governments is the impact on of Brexit upon reporting. I think um, put succinctly, I think it will be carry on regardless. And by that, whether it's hard Brexit, soft Brexit, or something in between, um, whichever scenario you paint out, then um, the requirement to report uh, to, to transaction report in the way that's been outlined under MIFIA it is unlikely to, to go away. So I think that is the message that um, we, we're hearing from, from regulators. It's also the message that I think people are, are going with internally in their planning, not just for reporting, but the other aspects of MIFIA within firms. Um, Matt, Darrow, any, anything to add to that? The statutory obligation of the FCA remains, and that's to monitor for market abuse and ensure the safety and soundness of the UK financial system. They have they invented transaction reporting, I believe, and um, 
therefore it's highly unlikely that anything is going to change anytime soon in terms of what is what is required to be reported. Yeah. Yeah. So, so MIFID II transaction reporting changes represent the sort of wish list that the FCA had at MIFID I for a wider net that they could cast to capture market abuse. And as Matt says, those requirements haven't changed from an FCA perspective. So uh, even if we were to uh, abandon MIFID altogether, I think we will have pretty much transaction reporting as it's outlined in MIFID II today. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dario. Um, before we go on to the next section, just uh, a couple of uh, admin points. I, I do believe we've got the slides um, up and you can see those. Any issues, do let us know. Um, follow up with a question. Secondly, I hope we're coming through loud and clear. If there's a problem with the volume, uh, then again, do let us know. I'm just going to pause for a second. I'm going to hand over to Philip, who's going to raise um, the first two of our polling questions. Philip. Okay, the first question that will come up on your screen is um, question number one. And apologise for this, we're just moving through the slide deck. You'll see it, um, you'll see the question coming up on your slide deck now. And question number one is how confident are you with regards to being on track for MIFID transaction reporting go live. Okay, so how confident are you with regards to being on track for MIFID transaction reporting going live? Okay, and if you could click your answers there, that'd be great. We'll shortly have the results. Me too. Any thought presenters on this? I think we'll come back to this in the Q&A section, this question, because it's quite a good, good one to, to focus on. Okay. Uh, it's pretty interesting, though. Half and half uh, confident. Uh, okay. um, that's kind of what I'd expect, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and now, Philip, also the second question as well, please. Second question is on your screen at the moment. So, when do you estimate that you'll be ready to participate in testing with the FCA? Okay. Slight correction on the question. That should be obviously 2017, the year there. <laughs> and just publish the results now. So again, good spread there. Great. Thanks, Philip. I think we'll come back to looking at some of these in the question and answers session because there's some, uh, some interesting um, aspects coming through on that. We're just going to move to the next section. So we've looked at what's on the um, on the desk of the uh, the regulators, be that ESMA, the National Competent Authorities, um, or, or the Commission itself. So now we're going to turn to what are the key industry issues in the in in meeting the MIFIR obligations for transaction reporting, and we've got these into really four four core sections. Um, it's not it's not exhaustive. There are other issues as well, but these are. These are issues that uh, we see being raised at the BBA working group, um, and they are uh, issues that have been uh, raised more broadly as well. Um, the first one is, uh, well, is again around regulatory decisions. On the previous slide, there was a, that we, we didn't touch upon it, but there was a, a note there about um, divergence of opinion of na national competent authorities. Now, MIFIR is a regulation, and so should be implemented consistently uh, among the member states. 
But in our discussions that we've had with both the FCA and ESMA, there are slight differences of opinions over some aspects of both the regulation and the directive. Um, we won't dwell on it too, too much, but one example uh, is a potential difference of opinion between Baffin and the FCA over what you determine as your counterparty. And a good way to illustrate this is using an example. In our conversations with the FCA and trades that we, uh, we, may, we may execute against a fund manager, the FCA are quite clear that the counterparty that, we, that they're looking to identify is the fund manager and not the fund. Whereas that interpretation in, in, in Germany um, and the soundings that we've heard from the Baffin is the other way around. So there are things to be ironed out there. We have raised them in the consultation paper um, that, we, that we sent back through, through the BBA. Um, and the, the ESMA and the competent authorities are aware of it and assure us that they are discussing to make that clear. So that could be one to watch for when the guidelines come out to see whether there's been any movement on that. I think the second area of, um, of concern we see, uh, and, and you may well have experienced conversations regarding this point internally as well, is the, to put it short, the concept of no LEI, no trade, um, and other issues to do with uh, counterparty identifiers. So, Matt, could you, um, could you, could you come in and share your thoughts on, on that? I think this is certainly a very important point, and it's Level of the, the, the directive or the top level of the regulation, um, but it does appear in RPS 22 that if you don't have a LEI for your counterparty, then they are expecting you not to transact with them. Um, I think that's an, an interesting read through, right the way through from the top, because it doesn't say it doesn't focus unless you're in the reporting, and it has obviously been highlighted back up to the top to point this out. So, top of your organisation. Top of your organisation to, to, to point this out. So. Whilst we have been, or firms have been busy gathering LEIs in order to comply better with the first level of EMEA, and I believe that LEI will be mandatory for the second level as of EMEA, so again that, that LEI collection exercise will continue apace, there will be clients who, probably from outside of Europe, who don't think they need to get an LEI, or certainly don't feel that they're obligated to get an LEI, who will in theory be cut out from trading with European MIFID regulated investment firms. So there are, I believe, industry initiatives and starting or in progress in flight to have a more coordinated approach to approaching those customers so they're not hammered by 20 letters of 20 sell side firms saying please get an LEI but there will be a gap at the end that where people haven't got LEIs and sitting around this table I don't know what the solution to that problem is it's something we've raised to the regulator the regulator's response has been fairly mooted in terms of that's what it says you need an LEI to identify that customer yeah. I think that that sounds very familiar and, and two key problems uh, I see with, 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 with the requirement is there's an unintended consequence here as well. So, you know, are we saying for small corporate clients that a number of our banks uh, service that we're going to stop trading and offering financial services to small corporates who, who aren't engaged, as sophisticated as and engaged as, as, as the larger uh, financial firms in the world? Are we really saying that we want to stop trading with those? So there is that unintended consequence that needs to be explored. And in addition, there are jurisdictions around the world where the requirements have an early eye is not there. So, so there are, there are some, some, some serious um, issues that, will, to Matt's point, mean that a number of our counterparties come January 2018 won't have an early eye. So I'd say that the problem is that you can't register an early eye for a third party entity. They have to either request it themselves or give you authority to request it for them. And today, the early eye database is about 500,000 records but there are significantly more firms across Europe trading. And the LEI registration process has been driven by the need to have an LEI for derivative trading. Exactly, yeah. And we have a whole host of firms that just do um, sort of securities trading that need to register for those LEIs. Um, the clients that we work with have struggled to get their 
their own clients, um, particularly outside Europe, as Matt says, to engage with them to get an LEI registration, particularly as the fees, £100 for an LEI registration, then you have ongoing maintenance fees. Um, it's, it's, you know, they can't see why they need it, and um, we've got a kind of a marketing exercise, really, to get those third country clients to, to get on board with the LEI process. Great. Thanks very much, Dario. Um, the, the requirements and the obligations to transaction report, there is, there is a, a massive change in how we are to, to report the instrument identifiers uh, in the transactions that we, we conclude. Um, put simply, there, it's put in uh, an obligation to, to use an ISIM at the centre of that change. And that comes with a host of, um, of um, implementation issues and also um, a, a, probably some fundamental issues where it just seems that it might not work as well. So, so Dario, I'm going to, Dario, I'm going to invite you to share your thoughts on maybe two, two problems, but I'll, I'll let you ch choose if you want to add anything else. Maybe if you can comment on the idea of how, we're going to, how ESMA is going to um, be able to collect and distribute the ISIN information from the trading venues, which we will then have to be we as financial firms will then have to consume to report and also talk about maybe some of the complexity of where an ISIN just won't be available and that, that, inst that instrument still needs to be reported. Sure, thank you. Um, well, just taking a step back, I think it's worth covering off what is the scope of the reporting obligation and the transaction reporting scope uh, is, is given with three tiers by, by the regulations. First off, any instrument that's admitted to trading on a trading venue, which means a regulated market, an MTF, or the new type of venue, an OTF, will have to have an ISIN um, uh, for every instrument. And th th that data needs to be submitted to the local competent authority for that venue on a daily basis per RTS 23. Uh, alongside that are any instruments for which a firm is a systematic internalizer, they'll also have to send instrument data through to um, their local competent authority. That data is then collected at the end of the day by the competent authority, compressed into a file, and then passed to ESMA. Um, those files have to reach ESMA by midnight of the end of the day, and ESMA will then compile that into a single file for distribution back to the competent authorities and to the public or to the industry by 8 a.m., I think, European time the next day. So those, we, we will have ISINs for all those instruments. However, the scope also applies to derivatives on those instruments and where those instruments are, those derivatives are uh, third country exchange traded derivatives or OTC derivatives, it's highly likely that they won't have ISINs. Um, a large number of the ETD exchanges don't use ISINs to identify their instrument set. So that's going to be a real problem. How do you identify an instrument on the CME for reporting purposes in a consistent way? So previously we had the AI code, but that's been abandoned by ESMA in favour of the ISIN. But there will be these situations where ISINs don't exist. The other challenge is that if you're trading an instrument with an underlier that has a basket of its securities or a um, index, you have to look through to the index and identify whether any of the index components are admitted to trading on a trading venue or an SI. And um, that, that, that means that uh, you're going to have to have details at the time of your trade of the components of various indices that you're trading. So there's those two problems. Now, ESMA is looking at this problem of what the identifiers for OTC derivatives. Um, the Association of Numbering Agencies has come out and said they will have a real-time ISIN issuance service for OTC derivatives, which I think would be very helpful. Um, those ISINs need to be in place as soon as the contract is, is agreed because there will be a, there may be a trade reporting obligation for that instrument. And uh, they will have to trade report within 15 minutes under RTS2 for derivatives. Um, I think the a wider problem is going to be the ETD space where third country ETDs, how are we going to identify those? Because we won't be able to get ISINs for those instruments because 
it, it's really up to those third country exchanges to request those ISINs. So that's a, a, a going to be an interesting conundrum. Um, ESMO is working on trying to define when an OTC instrument is the same as an on exchange or on venue instrument. Um, that again is going to be interesting because you will have the same in what's classified as the same instrument with different ISINs, etc. So um, it's, it's, it's a diff very, very difficult area. I think at least while there's some of this uncertainty may need to cl be clarified post 3rd of January, at least in the instrument space, you can report it, you can get it out the door because you can say you can imitate an OTC derivative, whereas in the client space, you have no choice, you cannot report that transaction at all. For the so, LEI? Yeah. yeah. At least there's some yeah, room to manoeuvre post 3rd of January whilst things evolve, yeah. shall we say. And, and this data collection point um, the under RTS 23, um, it's going to be a significant increase in the number of venues. So the FCA, I think, are considering uh, an expected 1,000 potential venues will be reporting that data on a daily basis to them, which they'll be compressing. Um, the scale of instruments within MIFID 1 reporting at the moment per venue, so the number of records that would be submitted or are being submitted today, is probably about 2.2 million for securities and the same for uh, exchange traded derivatives. Now that's at least going to double, I think, uh, and we may even get up to 10 million records that we passed on a daily basis that will form this, this kind of uh, ESMA list, which will be a go-to list for determining reportability. Great. Thanks very much, Jerry. So I think, uh, in summary, there there are you know there are the there are three significant concerns around instrument data. So it's key to determine the reportability of the transactions that you need to send out the door. It's key to identifying the instrument that you have traded, and then there's the practical um, implementation issues that have been listed as well. Mm -hmm. So from a firm perspective, this is a, a, a this should be in your kind of top five concerns of having the strategy and approach about how you will deal with uh, the obligations and requirements and keep up to date with developments as they go, go on because there will be developments and there will be changes between now, go live and after go live in this space. Okay, thanks very much. Um, one other item um, which is of concern is the requirement to report a short selling flag, which is linked to the disclosure requirement. Um, and I'm going to ask Matt just to comment briefly both on the scope of the ask and also there's a, there's a, I think there's a divergence again in approach in the industry between whether that calculation is required to be in real time or on a kind of T plus one batch. So, so Matt, if you could just um, share some thoughts on that, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, sure. I think the, the scope one is, it, it is confusing and it certainly has confused some people, so we'll just we'll start with that. So the short selling regulation is broadly divided into two parts. So the requirement to the definition of a short sale and what you need to do in terms of locating the security ahead of a short sale and then there's the disclosures obligation, part two of the, the short selling regulation, which is what, when you have a short position, how do you calculate that, and um, how do you then disclose that to the regulator? So for the short selling, in terms of the, lo the locate piece and the going short, towards the definition of that, that applies to equity instruments listed in the EEA and corporate bonds and government debt listed in the EEA. However, the disclosure obligation is broader than that, and so therefore you have to take into account derivative positions, etc., when calculating your, your overall short. For the purposes of transaction reporting, the regulation is clear. It points you back to what is the definition of a short sale, and that is clearly equities in the EEA and debt in the EEA. You don't have to consider going short via a derivative yeah. or having a short position by virtue of a, an ETF position um, where the underlying may be a, a European equity. So I think that's fairly clear. Um, I make no comment as to the rationale behind having the floor flag in the transaction report in the first place because I think anyone that's looked at it in detail says 
this is a fleeting moment in the history of the firm's position in that, in that security. It is a transaction by transaction basis um, and therefore doesn't really reflect short selling in the, in the real, 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 real terms of the word. So um, the firms have got several choices as to how they therefore implement this. Um, the first way of doing it is calculate it, real time, transaction report by transaction report. Did the firm go short on that transaction and publish it instantaneously to the regulator with the short sale flag populated? Alternatively, firms may wish to calculate this at the end of the day, or firms may wish to calculate it on the morning of the following day. You then ask yourself the question, well, why don't I just report all of my buys instantaneously and I'll hold up all of my sell transaction reports to a, another point in time and run that calculation. What is clear, or at least we believe is clear, is that the regulator doesn't want us to transaction report buys and sells as if they were just buys and sells and then run a calculation at a later point work out whether that transaction report should have been flagged with a short sell flag, cancel the original report and then re-report. That is a, a clear a, a clearish indication from the regulator that they don't want that. So it's going to be down to individual firms' implementations as to whether they do this real time or they do it on some sort of batch basis, either throughout the day or end of day or the beginning of the following day. But cancel and correcting doesn't sound like the right thing to do. Thanks very much, Matt. I think you can see the similarities in, in, in effort that firms are going to have to put in between instrument data and short selling. These are new demands upon firms. They are complicated and complex and will require significant amounts of thought in developing solutions within the firms to, to meet those obligations. Darrow, did you have anything you wanted to come in uh, on, on the... Yeah, so, I mean, there's other challenges around the short selling piece, uh, particularly around the life cycle of those those reports because you can calculate at, at the time of the trade your position but then find you've got some late book trades or there's firm up trades that haven't been included and that can then change what your position, short position was actually at the time of the reported trade. Um, so it, this is not going to be easy for firms. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, a big area of challenge. and um, But it, it's, uh, you know, it's in the regulation so firms have to plan to implement this as, as appropriate. But uh, as with all of the um, reporting, I think when you're planning your systems, etc., you need to think about how you're going to, how the operators are going to handle the ebbing and flowing of these reports, investigation of the reports when they get rejected, uh, reviewing the, 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 the fields in the reports when there's changes in the, the source data. Right. Um, so a usability sort of point there, really. Great. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, Philip, if I could hand over to you now, and if you could um, just introduce the third polling question. Yes. Um, should be on the screens now. Will you calculate the short selling flag in two options there, real time, trade dates plus one, for a couple more to respond to that. It's quite conclusive. Any thoughts? So I think There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that would help address some of the sort of uh, timing issues associated with the information coming through. I think one of the key things here is that unintended consequences from the regulator's perspective is that at the, the largely this impacts equities. The overwhelming volume of reporting is equities. Yeah. It's interesting there that trade day plus one is the, the, the most likely. Mm. Again, there's a subsection of that that says, are you holding up all of your cell transaction reports until T, T plus one and then reporting them? 
Because what's now going to happen is the regulator, when it opens its doors first thing in the morning, is going to be inundated with a large volume of equity transaction reports, rather than receiving them across the, across the working day. So as we've seen, sometimes the infrastructure creeps and groans. It's now going to creep and groan first thing in the morning if this causes that huge volume shift to, 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 the, to the early part of the day. Thanks very much, Matt. I'm just going to move on to the final section of the, um, of the conversation today. And it's really a question of what you need to do to get and stay on track for January 2018. Um, there's obviously a lot of work to be done between now and, and go live, and we really wanted to focus on, on three core, core areas that, um, that firms should be um, focusing on. Um, those three are developing an expert understanding of the obligations to you as a firm, so that you are, that puts you in a good position to, to create the right solution for your firm. I think secondly, following on from that expert understanding that you need to develop, it's, it's having the right, making the right decisions about the architecture of your solution. And then finally, putting controls at the center of your development as well and not having them as an add-on. And we're just going to go through these three themes with those around the table. I'm going to kick off with the expert understanding. And I'm going to ask Rob and Matt to, to comment on here. I think, Rob, if I could ask you to comment on the role that trade associations can help firms in developing that essential expert understanding of the obligations and requirements. And then, Matt, after Rob's, after Rob's finished, if you could maybe just touch upon how a large organization such as yours, looks to develop that expertise in, in, internally and, that, and how critical you, 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 you believe that is. So Rob, if you could just share some thoughts. I think what's interesting when you look at areas like transaction reporting is it is a, a very specialised technical area. And one of this is my own personal opinion rather than EPA view, but it's obvious that there are only so many people in the industry who really have the detailed knowledge to actually implement these systems and, and, and do the work. And often these people are also working on other projects as well, so they're not just working on the transaction reporting framework, they'll be working on other reporting frameworks and, and other sort of duties around the bank as well. So the idea of the trade association is to make things more efficient where you can come, you know, uh, say once every two weeks and speak to your peers who essentially will have the same concerns and in some cases can, we can work together and provide solutions as well. So, and I think this is particularly important perhaps for smaller organisations who might not be fortunate enough to have the resources to perhaps have people who are employed purely to different transaction reporting or at least do have smaller teams. So you should certainly use the resources you've got. You, know, you pay your BBA membership anyway. Do, do use the reporting work that you've got to, to help you build up the knowledge. Thanks very much, Rob. Matt, just from an uh, internal firm's perspective? Yeah, sure. What and works? I think the, um, it's interesting because we've had MIFID one, then we've had EMEA, then we're going to get EMEA two, now we've got SFTR. So we've got a lot of um, reporting obligations to, to manage, implement and deal with over the next 18 months. Um, and there's, there's, there is a, a degree of skill set there which, one, is a good product knowledge, two, is certainly a good knowledge of the firm um, and its internal systems. So continuing to develop that BA expertise and preferably keeping the same BAs on and involved in the reporting stream because the longer you're doing it the better you get at it and the better you see the way through it so I think the important piece is, is really to focus on the scenarios and understand how those scenarios or at least mapping your scenarios into ESMA scenarios to get the closest fit so you produce the, the right type transaction report in the first place I think, as we've already mentioned, the product piece is complicated and, and therefore it's going to need a degree of product expertise for the identification piece. I think what's also vitally important is that although this is not principles based regulation per se, there is always an underlying principle um, which can be referred to and doing the right thing. So, you know, presented with a situation internally thinking what do we think the regulator would like to see and trying to do the right thing, documenting why you think you've done the right thing. So later challenge would allow you to, I guess, defend yourself in a, in, to, a, to a degree 
So there's a definite reliance on a good compliance function to provide that principle base and that interpretation base where we're not given a perfect example from the regulator to, to adhere to. Thanks very much, Matt. I, ju I, I, I just throw, um, throw some, some thoughts in, in here as well. Um, I think at this cycle of the development, um, uh, at this stage in the development cycle, um, I think firms should really, really make sure that those that are in legal and compliance, and to make myself unpopular with those at the BBA working group, those that are on with BBA working groups, you need to make sure that those people are communicating what they know and their interpretations. Okay, this is the time where getting information from those sources is critical to developing that understanding. Um, so all of you who have members that go to the BBA working group, make sure that they are bringing back into the organisation um, the information which they're, and the knowledge that they are developing in those sessions. Equally, you know, I, 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 do, uh, I work at HSBC and there is, you know, we have legal and compliance working hand in glove and we can't, you can't underestimate how important getting their input into, into your um, decisions if you're in IT or in operations is to make, this is the time to make sure you get value from those types of people. Yeah, yeah I think there's going to be tremendous pressure on those areas and it's particularly, as, as Matt said, it's understanding your firm's actual trading scenarios. So that goes down to the legal arrangements that you're undertaking with your counterparties and clients and how you're trading with them and then translating that into what the reporting implications. Great. Thanks very much. We're going to move on to um, uh, just discuss the options around um, developing and building out the appropriate architecture. Uh, there are a number of options out there open to firms, both large and small. Uh, Darryl, could I ask you to talk through the merits of developing your own, building your own, buy off the shelf? thoughts that you have around that? <laughs> I think that's a bit of a big question. Uh, you've I'm got, not sure you've I'm got three minutes. I'm not sure I'm entirely <laughs> qualified to answer it. I mean, what I would say is around architecture, I mean, firms will have a preference internally. There are, but I would point to the fact that there is a lot going on in MIFID 2 and a, a lot going on in transaction reporting. And so it's not really a clear cut decision around internal or off the shelf. You, you might want to start looking at these things in terms of what components are available that you can leverage to save you development time, to save you processing high volumes of records. Uh, an obvious example would be the instrument static data. Are you going to build your own static data or are you going to buy that in? Um, reportability assessments um, against the ESMA list of instrument static, for example, taking that list in of potentially 10, 15 million records and processing that on a daily basis, uh, there will be services available to do that. Um, smaller firms, I would say, would, are going to be more open to looking at third-party solutions. And it, I, I still expect that post-go-live, there will be a lot of change around the interpretations in Method 2 and understanding will grow as that new regime uh, matures. Um, that will bring with it change, and we've seen that kind of change go through on EMEA. Uh, we've had several stages of change that had an impact on the IT implementations. And then my final point would be, and I think I made this earlier, when you're, if you're building in-house, do think about the operations teams that are going to be handling the reporting process and investigating reports. Uh, MIFID 2 is far, far more complicated than MIFID 1. You've got a lot more fields, but you've got to deal with all these scenarios and trading scenarios and reporting scenarios. So th those individuals in the op operations area are going to need access to, the, to have visibility of what's happened to a trade, be able to access what's happened in the source systems, how it's, what the implications from the regulator are in terms of accepting that trade, uh, to enable it to be properly investigated and that could be looking at counterparty information, static data information, or your source system data. Great. So Thank you. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, and finally, if, we've, lo if, if we, we've looked at expert understanding of the requirements and obligations, the importance of making the right decisions about architecture, I think that 
any of those that have been involved in uh, delivering upon regulatory obligations over the last 10 years, they would recognize the fact that often when you come into the development cycle, the controls aspect is the first thing that gets knocked off the critical path because people think we can go live without it. Touching, picking up from what Dario has just said about the level of complexity that is involved around uh, involved in implementing uh, MISFIA, and also touching upon the fact that the level of tolerance for getting things incorrect is going to be materially lower for, for January 17. Developing and building the appropriate controls up front and early is critical for the success of your delivery project. Not only in itself, but it is also mandated in the regulation itself. So quite specific and quite unique for, for um, regulatory reporting regulations that, that I've been involved in over the last few years, DFA, EMEA, etc. It actually mandates not only you should have a reconciliation, but between which points you should reconcile. So between your trade capture or books and record system and to the regulator. It also mandates that you should have testing. So this is very specific. And again, is linked into the theme that the tolerance of you not understanding where your data quality problems are is, is not going to be tolerated. So just conclude on, on, on that. We have just under 10 minutes left on the, um, the webinar. Um, just like to, um, to, to recap on what we, we've been through so people are, people are clear on what, we've, what we're saying here today. So there are issues, there are outstanding items that we're expecting from the, for the regulator to deliver, so keep an eye out on those. They, they need to be followed, those developments need to be followed and responded to. There are key industry issues that will require firms' attentions, attention and develop solutions to them. And finally, um, to stay on track, focus, there's a real need to focus on those three core areas of understanding what you need to do, how you're going to do it, and how you're going to prove that what you're doing is correct. We have put this section over to Q&A, and we have had a few questions that have come in whilst we've been chatting. Philip, is it, is it possible to also get the poll results up on the screens as well? Certainly, the, the, the last poll um, okay. um, on there, um, the, the delegates may not be able to see that Fine. poll, okay. but um, perhaps um, we can talk around um, some of the questions. Right, okay. So we've got a few questions that have come in. I think there, I mean, there, are, there are a couple which we're going to respond to um, in writing because they're quite detailed and specific and this probably isn't the best medium to, to answer those questions. Um, there is a question here, is there going to be any impact interference on the global personal data? If I interpret that question and I'll throw it out to the, um, out to the audience that we have here, if, I get, if my interpretation is incorrect, then feel, do please feel free to get in contact with us. But I guess this is looking at how MIFIR is mandating the requirement to identify um, the decision maker and the individual that's executed the trade. Um, and in my, from my understanding, people have raised whether this, this, this would conflict with personal data laws within the EU. And I think when we've raised this to regulators before, the answer has been no. I mean, Matt, have you had any other? A no. A no. I think it's <laughs> quite simply the, the starting point is no. Darren is yeah, so there is a tension between um, the uh, banking secrecy laws in various jurisdictions outside of Europe that will be problematic. So essentially what you're doing with your transaction report, you're telling the, the, your, C, your competent authority and those in the chain that um, you have a client that's a member, of, uh, that's a client of your bank. And that disclosure in certain jurisdictions like Taiwan is a criminal offence, I think. Um, so there is that tension. We had that tension under EMEA and uh, we sort of got to a happy place, but um, um, it, it still needs to be looked at quite closely. Excellent. We're going to set, there's, there's two other questions which we're, we're going to look at. One on the topic of short selling. I'm going to read it out because it gives a bit of context um, to, to the question. So the questionnaire said, my understanding is that the short sell indication is a real time and not a batch requirement. To implement a batch solution is much simpler than real time for obvious reasons. The reasons I believe short sell indication is a real time requirement 
is that the regulator will want to know if, for example, a firm is being sold into the ground as soon as possible. Shall I take that one? Please, Matt. I, I think that's an, in that's an interesting point. I, the, it's not real time or batch in terms of the actual sending of the transaction report, though, because you still have until the end of T plus one to send the report, no matter how you calculate it, real, the short sell flag, real time or batch. So the the regulation wants to know whether you went short at the time of the transaction, and that's basically the process that's going to be done. It will be, that calculation will be run real time, or that calculation will be run batch. In case, and, and if it's batch, it will obviously be winding back the position over the course of the day to the time of the transaction, and then deciding whether the firm went short at that point in time. You still have to the end of T plus one to report it, so the regulator doesn't have the ability to. I can't quite remember what the wording was, to see a firm being shorted at the actual point in time it is being shorted. So I don't believe that's the regulatory Thanks. intention. Thanks, Matt. Just one final question. I think this might be a yes or no answer. What about natural person ID, i.e. No, no natural person ID, no trade? The example given is Spain, e.g. it only allows tax ID, no CONCAT. So a client with Spanish nationality without tax ID can't trade. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's correct. That's based on the uh, I think it's Annex Two in the uh, RTS 22. So the, Span the Spaniards or the CNMV hasn't identified an alternative to the uh, the uh, national identifier in Spain. Um, I certainly would expect them to come up with something. Right. I think uh, there in, are in, in due, due course. We have the BBA been through, I, actually I say we, a member firm has done a superb job of going through the various, ta the, the table in, our, in, in um, Appendix 2 and has pointed out several discrepancies and issues with various combinations of national, identi of national identification, of which that Spanish one is a good example, because that would imply you can't be Spanish unless you have a national tax ID. And I don't know whether that's the case, but it's, it's certainly an interesting, an interesting one. Um, we'll go, we are going to be going through that again in the next couple of weeks, by all means. We will feed these obvious discrepancies back to ESMA to, to say, what do you want us to do in these scenarios? Because these are real life scenarios that legally really exist. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to take that time to, to wrap up. Thank everybody around the table who's, who's participated. Thank you on the line as well for your involvement, both in the polling questions and the questions that you have raised. For the questions that have been raised which we haven't answered, we will provide a written answer to those when we distribute uh, the pack. Um, and I will hand back to Philip to conclude the, um, the meeting. Well, thank you very much. It's been really interactive. Thank you very much for your engagement on this. Thank you very much to um, also the presenters who've delivered on this webinar. It's been insightful and thoughtful, but it's only one step, really. And we've got forthcoming, Dario, uh, a, a workshop on the 10th of October, which um, goes into a bit more detail on some of these, unpacking some of these questions. Do you want to briefly just highlight what you're going to be discussing and sharing on, on that workshop? Um, yeah, sure, Philip. Um, the, um, the workshop's aimed at giving an overview of the transaction reporting obligation under Lisa 2 and how that will work in practice. It's, it's aimed at anybody that will be touching that area, whether it's a BA working on the process, a project manager, people in compliance, etc. Uh, we will be digging into all the identifier stuff, the scope issues, that we're, and, and, and looking at the areas of challenge. Um, so it will be fairly comprehensive and it will be a hard day's work if you sign up for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you for that. We've also got a forthcoming conference um, as well next month, details which we will distribute and circulate um, to you straight after this webinar. An on-demand version of the webinar along with the PDF of the slides will be available by close of play today. If you do have any questions, as Ian said, please do not hesitate to either contact myself or Robert, the BBA. If you want to join as a bank, and the um, working party, working group on, on this issue, um, please contact Rob again. I'll socialise his details um, to you as well. Thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you.